gentlemen, distinguished guests. Good afternoon. On behalf of UNOG and the library, you cannot, you cannot hear? Can you hear me now? Yes? Ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, dear guests, dear friends of the library, good afternoon and welcome to this special library talk today. As you can see, you very many, and so we had to get a different <laughs> location. I'm being told you can't hear me. Yes, better now. Okay, thank you. Thank you. This is a special library talk today. We're here today. We're very pleased to, to host this report launch today on, this, on the global state of democracy. To, together with the International Institute for Democracy and Electoral Assistance, I will introduce them in, in a second. We have today an event divided in two parts. We have very high level speakers today, so we will accommodate them in a series of, of keynotes. And then we will have the presentation of the report, the reasons why we're launching today, the, uh, the, the, the report on the global state of democracy. And then we will have a question and answers as, as it is uh, <coughs> customary with library talks. I must say that this will be very short. I, I keep seeing people that don't hear. Can you do something about this? Yeah, can you hear me now? No. So. Per Voices heard in the room. Yeah. Don't need earphones. Exactly. The earphones. Okay. Now we. It's louder now. Okay. Your earphones are not working. What What is working is the audio in the room. So sorry about that. So, without further ado, I would like to to start because we got a little bit late because of this microphone issue, uh, by inviting the director general of you, Mr. Michael Muller, to give his welcoming remarks. Thank you, Director General. Thank you. Secretary General Nunn, Secretary General Term, Director General Sagar, Ms. Ibid, Mr. Andaria, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the Palais des Nations for the launch of International Ideas Report, The Global State of Democracy. And I'd like to thank the organizers of this event, the Office of International Idea to the European Union and the Kofi Annan Foundation for making this possible. And I'd like to, of course, especially like to thank uh, Mr. Kofi Annan and Mr. Yves Le Terme for taking the time to be with us today. I know I speak for all of us when I say that we look forward to hearing their thoughts on a topic as vital as democracy. Of course, it's no easy feat to grapple with the current state of democracy, let alone to predict its future. It is telling, however, that International Idea is launching its biennial report series 25 years after the publication of The End of History and The Last Man by Francis Fukuyama. It posits that the end of the Cold War was marked by inevitable triumph of Western liberal democracy. <coughs> what a difference 25 years can make. The euphoria of yesterday has given way to the hand-wringing of today, and not without reason. Systemic Shocks over the last decades have challenged democracies at home and abroad. Public frustration with imperfect institutions is fueling the fragmentation of societies, the polarization of policies, and the demonization of others. Increasing inequalities and growing trust deficit at every level of governance undermine the bonds that unite us. And yet, I think it would be a mistake to discount democracy, to surrender to the current sense of gloom. What is needed instead is a level-headed examination of the challenges facing democracy, an analysis of the policy options at hand that give it a new lease on life. And that is exactly what International Idea is unveiling today. The global state of democracy recognizes setbacks. Democracy has been dealt recently, recently but it places these in the context of long-term positive trends, providing a nuanced, fact-based understanding. It examines key issues like migration and inequality, as well as the vital contributions of women and young people. In light of the report's holistic approach, it is particularly fitting that it is being launched here in Geneva, a city that makes it easier to collaborate and exchange information across disciplines and silos. Together, the more than 100 international organizations, hundreds of NGOs and world-class academic institutions that make up International Geneva contribute to democracy in their own way. 
For example, the International Labour Organization has taken the lead in setting norms for democracy in the workplace. Looking back to the, mistake, the mistaken assumptions of the past, let us remember that democracy is not a destination, it's a path, one marked by struggles and setbacks, that we should follow a different path. In truth, there is no other path. Or to quote Winston Churchill, democracy is the worst form of government except for all those other forms that have been tried from time to time. Going forward, success will depend on facts and even keeled analysis of the kind offered by this report and not hyperbole. And I look forward to a production discussion. I thank you very much for being with us today. And um, I hope you all will enjoy the discussion today. Thank you. Thank you, Director General. The report we're launching today is produced biannually by the International Institute for Democracy and Electoral Assistance, as I said before, and Mr. Yves Leter is the Secretary General of International IDEA, and I would like to invite you to provide us with the first keynote address, sir. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. Secretary General. Um, Mr. Director General, Mr. Muller, Mr. Director General of the Swiss Development Corporation, distinguished representatives of government, um, representatives of diplomatic missions to Switzerland and to the United Nations, and uh, diplomatic missions of international IDEA member states, dear friends from the Kofi Annan Foundation, of course, uh, Mr. Special Envoy, Master de Mistura, Ladies and gentlemen, representatives of uh, civil society, media, academic, dear students, colleagues and friends. It is indeed with great pride that I stand here today to introduce what we call at the International Idea our new flagship publication called The Global State of Democracy, Exploring Democracy's Resilience. The publication provides a so-called health check of democracy worldwide. But as you might know or don't know, International IDEA as an intergovernmental organization launched some 22 years ago um, has a mandate to, on a daily basis, so to say, with the whole team of experts to advance and support democracy worldwide. And our aim with this report we present today is to contribute, to contribute to the current somewhat uh, concerned public debate on the state of democracy, and moreover to spur political and policy actions to concretely address the current challenges that put democracy under pressure. But of course, before um, I go into some of the key findings of the report, allow me to start by thanking the Kofi Annan Foundation and its chairman, Your Excellency Annan, the United Nations Office here in Geneva and the Government of Switzerland, Mr. Director General, for making this presentation possible and for partnering with us in this organization. Indeed, before giving the floor later um, to Nathalie Ebeat, the most important author and coordinator of the whole of the research effort underpinning this report, I would like to touch briefly on what insights the report provides on, on the one hand advances, clear advances of democracy during the last 40 years, but on the other hand, as was said already, of course, also some challenges, present challenges to democracy worldwide. And I will start with the gains. I indeed would like to start with the gains by counteracting more or less the bleak view that is often portrayed currently in the media on the global state of democracy, and I would like to highlight at least three to four key democratic gains in the past 40 years. The number one. The number one is that the global state of democracy report, and you have copies in the room for each of one of you. Well, this report holds that if we take this historical perspective of 40 years, democracy, in fact, has proven quite resilient over time. There has indeed, in terms of the electoral democracy, there has been a 
fantastic growth in the number of electoral democracies, countries in which real competitive elections determine government power. From only a quarter of the world's countries' nations in 1975 to more than 65% currently. More than 3.5 billion of world citizens today have the right to participate in elections to appoint the uh, members of the public authorities. And we have recent democratic transitions like Tunisia, but also Myanmar, showing that there is progress, but of course still challenges. But very importantly, first positive development, the tremendous increase of the number of electoral democracies. A second very important progress, when you put it in a historical perspective, although there is still a lot of work to do, the other significant gain is the progress made in the political representation of women, doubling in the last 20 years to 23% now. Of course, this is still too low. It's still a scandal that only one-fifth of parliamentarians in the world are women. It is shameful, but still this is progress, and it shows to some extent the way to continue. The third uh, important advance for democracy in the last 40 years that is documented in the study is that there has been a lot of progress in terms of the number of people participating in political debate. Of course, there the boost given by the global spread of ICTs, so-called social media, that revolutionized access to information, well, these have contributed to bringing elected leaders closer to citizens, sometimes too close to citizens, amplified citizens' voice, and transformed, really transformed interactions in the political arena. There is, of course, also a so-called flip side. There are indeed downsides to, for instance, the social media boom. Its requirements for speed and quickly digestible information may indeed not always be appropriate for enabling a nuanced public debate on democracy. Democracy indeed takes time, deserves nuance, and that time perspective and nuance may sometimes be forgotten in the social media frenzy. But anyway, the third positive development is this gigantic increase in the number of interactions and at least the opportunities to interact. The fourth positive trend is that, and I will come back on that, when we see that democracy is challenged, the citizens increasingly stick to the promise for democracy. And so it means, bluntly put, that there is not so much an issue in terms of the demand for democracy. No, the negative part is that the offer, the quality of the offer, sometimes is lacking and frustrates people. But anyway, these four findings that are described in the report are to be perceived as positive. But however, ladies and gentlemen, despite these positive trends, our report also highlights a number of serious challenges and threats to democracy, more specifically representative democracy, threats that remain and new ones that are emerging. And these threats may endanger gains in new democracy, but also, more importantly maybe, corrode democratic principles and practices in both new and established democracies. And moreover, we see that starting from 75 to 2015, when we consider more precisely, specifically the last 10, 15 years, including in the statistics, and our report highlights five key challenges to democracy, that there have been rising problems, at least in five domains. First, we have witnessed and we document this phenomenon. We witness increasingly the so-called modern democratic backsliding and a shrinking democratic space. Modern democratic backsliding as opposed to traditional democratic backsliding where authoritarian leaders take over. We see indeed a number of governments extended their mandate through constitutional amendments, increasing concentration of power in executive branches, undermining the independence of judiciary, limiting political freedoms, media restrictions, tight control of democratic competition, and restriction of opposition parties, curbing of civil society action as examples. 
And this modern democratic backsliding is really very apparent, especially in the last 10 to 15 years, including sometimes in traditionally deeply rooted democracies. In the same range, we also note a rise in the number of so-called hybrid democracies, with countries adopting the formal characteristics of democracy, including periodic elections, with, in fact, allowing little real competition for power, with weak respect for basic political and civil rights, and for the rule of law. The second negative trend we document in the report is the rise of populism and nationalism. Populism and nationalism on the rise in both new and older democracies. And these risk corroding democracy from within. Indeed, populist political parties exploit their electorate's dissatisfactions and fears and capitalize upon increasing polarization in society, scapegoating with extremist and exclusionary rhetoric on migration, on, for instance, religion, and fairness occupying a more prominent space in the public discourse. In the rise of populism and nationalism, and more specifically also scapegoating, of course, the new phenomenon of fake news, and on the other hand, also state-sponsored misinformation and propaganda is really worrying. And cyber insecurity has, during the last years, increasingly become a threat, including to the integrity of electoral processes. And this needs really concerted action, more concerted action, by both established and new democracies. Third negative trend, specifically in what we call then the more mature democracies, the rooted democracies in the West, for instance, we also see a decreasing level of trust in the traditional representative democratic institutions, increased disengagement of the electorate, particularly, and this is very worrying, of the young people. As a result, of course, as a result of dissatisfaction with the ability of democracy to deliver, deliver on the core issues like economic well-being and equity. Fourth, there is the uh, issue in most places in the world still of a, a very important negative impact of capture, of corruption, and the unchecked infusion of money in <coughs> politics and in elections, which also contribute to undermine a fundamental precondition for legitimacy, democratic legitimacy, namely the trust in the process. Fifth, last but not least, there is, of course, the, numerous, the range of numerous conflicts, sources of insecurity in different places all over the world, which leads to a massive internal displacement and millions seeking refuge, refuge in neighboring countries and beyond. We all know that the massive influx, for instance, into Europe has had political implications, boosting anti-immigration parties and fueling populism. Ladies and gentlemen, I leave it there in terms of some positive tendencies, but more importantly, more, um, let's say, concerning developments that should be addressed. To conclude, I would say that uh, we think the publication of such a report, where our ambition is to go a little bit beyond the traditional rankings, hit parades of countries in terms of the quality of their democracy, trying to assess, to analyze deeper trends, we think that the publication of this report is critical. Recent developments across the world have led many to even question sometimes the value, the potential of democracy, and at the same time, cynicism and pessimism sometimes seems to have overtaken the public uh, debate. We hope that this report will help us to take real stock on the one hand of progress, but also of challenges. And our hope is that it will help spur and renew the public debate on democracy and inspire action to build, to strengthen, to regenerate, and to safeguard democracy. And it is there, of course, not just the responsibility of politicians to do this. Other stakeholders also have a key role in this process, civil society, academics, the media, and of course, the whole of the citizens. Let me conclude with the central message in this report about the state of democracy and about the sources of resilience of democracy. And this central message sounds, I quote, democracy can never be taken for granted. And each one of us has the responsibility to build, to protect, and to safeguard it. 
I hope that by publishing this report, we add to the tools that are available to win this fight for democracy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Leterme. Before we go to the uh, to illustration, to present the presentation of the report, I would like to give the floor to a second keynote address by Mr. Manuel Saga, who is the Director General of the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. It's a great pleasure to be here, distinguished guests and speakers, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to be here and to represent the host country at the launch of the Global State of Democracy publication. I believe you can all commend International IDEA for nourishing this important debate on the state of, uh, of democracy and for, for the contribution they have made to this uh, important discussion. Switzerland has been a member of International IDEA since 2006, and we have always greatly appreciated the work this uh, Center of Excellence has uh, done, a center of excellence for democracy, which combines outstanding research with sound advice for political practitioners. Both are very much needed. Corruption and self-interest in politics fuel an increasing disconnect between citizens and political parties. Rising populism nurtures repressive policies at odds with multicultural and inclusive societies. The IDEA publication identifies these and other challenges to democracy, but it also tells us that the glass is half full. One of the publication's key findings is, I quote, the continuity of democracy at the highest level in world history, which is reassuring indeed. We particularly appreciate the solutions-oriented approach reflected in the publication. The report proposes a set of effective measures to strengthen the resilience of democracy. Democracy, of course, cannot be taken for granted, and the institutions, democratic institutions, are in perpetual motion, also in Switzerland. As most of you know, we are currently here in Switzerland debating the role of the media and more specifically of public broadcasters. On the surface, as often, the controversy is about costs and finances, but ultimately it is about the role of the state as a participant in public discourse. It is about access to politically relevant information and the significance of cultural diversity. Ladies and gentlemen, because we take democracy rights and institutions so seriously at home here in Switzerland, the promotion of democracy is also an important objective of our foreign policy, enshrined in the Constitution, no less. Article 54 of our Constitution mentions the respect for human rights and democracy alongside alleviation of poverty and peaceful coexistence of peoples as well as the conservation of natural resources. For us at SDC, the Swiss Agency for Development Cooperation, democratic institutions are not an end in and of themselves. They ensure access to equitable distribution of and resources towards a dem uh, and. Uh, access of and, and equi equitable uh, distribution of resources towards a democracy that delivers, a democracy that delivers. Democracy must bring about concrete improvements in the well-being of the people. Often in our partner countries, the tradition of constructive dialogue is rather weak. Decision-making pr processes are confrontational. Therefore, SDC tries to foster peaceful negotiations between civil societies and authorities to find common solutions. For instance, in Tunisia in 2016, we contributed to a stable environment for elections by committing the political parties to a code of conduct during the critical period. Our, report to our support rather, to local radio stations provided better access to information in remote areas. 
However, in the eyes of many Tunisian citizens, reforms are progressing too slowly. Economic indicators are on a downward trend, and new opportunities for young people are not in sight. A general sense of disenchantment may well lead to a loss of faith in a democracy that is desperately expected to deliver. This is why STC not only helps to strengthen democracy, but at the same time to promote inclusive economic development. In most of its partner countries, SDC puts a particular emphasis on supporting people in holding their governments accountable for their decisions and their performance. SDC often supports democratic processes at local levels where citizens can engage more easily with state institutions on issues directly affecting their lives, such as education or health services for their children. In Bosnia and Herzegovina, for example, STC has facilitated the participation of citizens in the preparation of municipal development plans and budget. As a result, in a period of four years, one million citizens were involved in prioritizing investments in infrastructure and public services. At the same time, the opportunities for citizens and civil society organizations to participate in political processes are shrinking in many countries. To strengthen democratic processes, SDC concentrates on a variety of actors. Parliaments, the judiciary, public oversight institutions, civil society organizations, and the media are crucial elements of a functioning democracy. For example, SDC helps parliaments to improve their ability to control state budgets, draft quality legislation, and to develop a constructive discourse both internally within the parliament and also with the public. We have various programs of this nature in the Balkans and Central and East Asia. Another example would be our support to the prevent, prevention and combating of corruption bureau in Tanzania, which facilitated four major asset recovery cases. Ladies and gentlemen, as we all know, democratization is a long-term and non-linear process. The Global State of Democracy publication tracking developments over 40 years shows that history is on the side of democracy. That should be all the encouragement we need to stay our own course of democracy and to help those who may be a, less, a little less further along and those who are str still struggling to find it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador Sager. It's now time to go a little bit more into the, in depth into the report that we're launching today. And to do that, I would like to ask Natalie Eberhard, who the head, is head of uh, Democracy Assessment and Analysis and Advisory Unit at International IDEA, and is also one of the main co-authors of this report, to guide us through the report and flag to us the main findings of it. Natalie, the floor is yours. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, media headlines these days are dominated by the question of whether democracy is in decline, the effectiveness of the democratic system, and whether or not it is valuable to have democracy or not, is raging among citizens and policymakers alike. And the first edition of the Global State of Democracy is a contribution to this debate. It aims to provide global and regional trends analysis, um, from 1975 to 2015. 1975 because it coincides with the third wave of democracy and the signing of two UN conventions on civil and liberal rights and economic and social rights. And to 2015 because that is 
the most up-to-date data available for 155 countries that we measured based on a new Global State of Democracy Index. This publication aims to contribute to the Sustainable Development Goals and particularly SDG 16 in the world's pursuit of more peaceful and inclusive societies. Indeed, when we look at the picture globally, there is some good news. Elections have become more common. They are cleaner today, and there is less fraud and manipulation and irregularity. Governments are also now more representative of and accountable to their constituencies. More countries respect fundamental rights of their citizens today. Social rights and equality have also seen significant improvements. What our publication tries to do is to not prove whether democracy is resilient or not, but to look at the enabling conditions under which democratic systems can recover from challenges and uh, crises, how they can adapt, be flexible and innovative in the face of them. So our key message is that while there is some good news, democracy cannot be taken for granted because we have also seen, uh, despite these positive developments, a slowdown in the progress since 1990 and again since 2005. There have been 24 democratic reversals since 2005 in the world and therefore we need to safeguard and protect democracy. So if we look at the global state of democracy today, what, what is it? What is the global state? The de basically when we uh, look at the definition, when we have measured um, democracy, Sorry, I will go back to the second key message because now I see it's on your screen. Uh, the, first, the, the second key finding of our publication is that in the face of democratic backsliding, um, the value people give to democracy the, is actually not affected, it actually increases. Um, so how people view and value democracy strengthens in the face of uh, democratic challenges. So in terms of the global state of democracy today, when we analyzed it, we analyzed it on the basis of IDEA's broad definition of democracy, which encompasses the two principles you see in the blue circle, which is popular control over decision making and equality in that control. The idea being that the will of the people is the basis for the legitimacy and authority of sovereign states. And as such, IDEA has quite a unique definition because our definition includes civil and liberal rights, economic and social rights, as well as rule of law and governance elements. And this definition we have translated into a quantitative measurement based on the five attributes you see in the inner circle, representative government, fundamental rights, checks on government, impartial administration, and participatory engagement. And in terms of the global view, the world view, the picture is that on representative government and on checks on government, so representative government meaning how clean are elections these days, how inclusive are elections, how many people are actually able to vote, how free are political parties to operate, and how many times do elections actually take place for governments, as well as how effective are parliaments, how independent are judiciaries, and how well do media um, are able, are, how well is media able to perform its watchdog functions? In the, from a global perspective, we have seen an increase in these, uh, in these two attributes since 1975. However, when you dig down into different regions and countries, you see that regions such as Europe, Latin America, and the Caribbean and North America have higher degrees of representation than Africa, Asia, and the Pacific, and Middle East and Iran. When you look at the fundamental rights attribute, Again, we have witnessed a, a stark increase in 1975 and again in 1990 on the manner in which countries are, provide access to justice, civil liberties, and social rights and equality. The, the exception being that the social rights and equality trend is quite linear. It has been quite difficult since 1990 uh, because we see relative stability since then for countries and democracies to provide economic and social rights on an equitable basis for their citizens. In that attribute, we also measure gender equality. And what we see is that although gender equality has gradually increased in all regions, it has done so on different speeds and at different levels. With North America and Europe leading the trend, 
but um, still room for improvement even in these regions, given the un imbalance still in representation of women and men all over the world, and room for improvement in regions such as Asia and Asia the and the Pacific and Middle East and Iran. Perhaps the attribute where we have seen no <coughs> change at all since 1975 is the attribute impartial administration which measures absence of corruption and implementation of rule of law. It is as difficult today as it was in 1975 for democracies to combat corruption and to ensure that rule of law is implemented. On participatory engagement, which was perhaps the most difficult attribute to measure because it is regulated very differently in terms of legislation in many countries in the world. We measured sub-local elections, uh, direct democracy mechanisms, meaning their availability and their quantity and how many times they are used, electoral participation and also civil society participation. And on a global picture, we also have a very positive one. There are more civil society actors able to function in the world today than in 1975. We have more direct democracy mechanisms. We are able to participate more in elections than ever before. However, uh, the direct democracy mechanisms, while they are available and uh, while there are more of them, the world is not very good at implementing uh, them in a, as often as they perhaps could. Um, and electoral participation especially has seen a decrease in various regions of the world, in particular in Europe, where you have several established democracies which have seen a decrease in the last 40 years. So from a global perspective, one can say that these challenges, these findings challenge the pessimistic view that democracy is perhaps in decline. But we also acknowledge that many aspects of this, of, of democracy's um, progress are also under challenge. And when we say, when we measure, ex when we explore democratic resilience in our publication, what we are looking at, or well, how we are defining it, um, is the fact, is, is by looking at how well countries and regions, um, how well countries and regions um, recover from ch uh, challenges and crises when they are confronted with them, used by four characteristics. And, and th that these four characteristics are recovery, flexibility, innovation, and adaptation, meaning uh, uh, democratic institutions such as governments, parliaments, political parties, civil society, and the media, the actors in the democratic system, how well they are able to uh, adapt to changing times is a definition of uh, the underlying definition of what we're looking at under enabling conditions. So what makes uh, a system resilient? In fact, um, there are four elements to this. The first are the citizens and civil society themselves. If citizens are committed to democracy, to the, its ideal, and continue to engage with it, it is one of the key elements that is a factor in whether a democratic system is able to withstand a challenge or a crisis. The autonomy, independence, and strength of its institutions, and by institutions I mean the actors I have just mentioned, whether they are free from being captured by the uh, um, interests of elites, by money, by uh, things like this, if they are able to withstand this challenge, a democratic system is more resilient than not. And a democratic resilience can also be designed in the sense that constitution building systems electoral systems can be designed to be more inclusive, to be more accountable, that, and elections can also be um, safeguarded by designing electoral integrity into a system depending on how that electoral system is designed. So these are the key elements that we use when we look at the five challenges that we believe are these days putting most pressure on democracy. And the first one being democratic backsliding. And what we see in the world today in relation to democratic backsliding is that there is more sophistication in the manner in which um, democratic backsliding occurs these days. Next slide, please. Um, in the sense that we see more a sophistication in the way leaders these days legitimately use 
uh, their, uh, the democratic system via elections, via referendum, to uh, aggrandize their executive power to the detriment of checks and balances. While there are still traditional means of democratic backsliding, such as coup d'etats and, and your classical voter fraud, such as stuffing of ballot boxes that occurs in the world today, we see less of this and more of the sophisticated kind. And the effects that democratic backsliding has on uh, democracies, our index shows, next slide please, that, um, that uh, actually the um, attributes are the four, it, it, Almost all attributes of democracy are affected by democratic backsliding, perhaps unsurprisingly, representation, fundamental rights, impartial administration, and also checks on government. The only one that is not affected so much is participatory engagement. And that tells us that citizens, in fact, are the key bulwark against uh, democratic backsliding. They are the factor that can prevent uh, uh, it occurring. We also have found that there is a relationship between democratic backsliding events and the comparative deterioration of public order. So violence in these contexts becomes a catch-22. The power of, uh, when concentration of power increases, uh, dissatisfaction of citizens also does, and this can ignite violence. And we see a relationship between democratic backsliding and development. Our index suggests that in countries that suffer democratic backsliding, social rights and equality are much more less, they are much less able to provide uh, social uh, rights and equality. So what should be done about democratic backsliding? Again, it comes down to courts, parliaments, and the media as the three key actors that need to work together with citizens to counter democratic backsliding when it occurs. But also regional organizations have a key role to play in terms of being able to influence their neighbors or their memberships uh, when, when backsliding occurs. Next slide, please. Um, one of the key challenges that, are, that we believe is putting um, a lot of pressure on democracy these days, some people term the crisis of representation or the changing nature in which political parties are um, increasingly not, uh, engaging with citizens who are changing the way they are engaging politically through new technologies, social media, or by taking to the streets. So protest has become an increasingly popular and also legitimate form of expressing political opinion because as democracies are evolving. And what has happened is that governments, in a bid to regain trust of their citizens, increasingly also turn to direct democracy instruments, such as referendums. Between 2015 and 2017, we have seen countries as diverse as Colombia, Cote d'Ivoire, Hungary, Italy, Netherlands, Sudan, Switzerland, the UK, Tajikistan, Turkey, Venezuela, and Zambia having referendums to make decisions. And with these two challenges also come dilemmas for policymakers, and in this case for political parties, in how they, are, how they must change the nature in which they engage with citizens to ensure that what that they also represent them well in the democratic system. And in our view, political parties must address four key challenges to actually fundamentally survive uh, in a democratic system. They must um, be honest about the fact that many of the challenges that democracy faces today are transnational in nature and not always easily only solved on national level. So they must be honest with their constituents as to what can really be solved on national level and what must perhaps be better solved on regional and international level. Terrorism and migration are two such phenomena. They must also restore citizens' sense of inclusion, particularly women and young people who no longer engage with political parties in the same way as they did before. And they must respond to the challenge of populism uh, in, in ensuring that there is a more fact-based dialogue uh, and not easy solutions presented uh, to complicated challenges. And they must adapt to the changing nature of the way we communicate in terms of finding innovative ways to interact with, also through new technologies, with their electorate. Next slide, please. In terms of money influence and corruption, we see big money being the conduit for undue influence and corruption, and what it does to democracy is that it creates an unlevel playing field, particularly for women and youth. 
it channels uh, corruption and policy capture, and it erodes trust among the public. And what we see is that current political finance regulations fall short to combat this phenomenon. And what is actually, in fact, needed is a wider holistic approach to better equip uh, political institutions to resist this negative influence of money. And what we mean by this is we need new innovative instruments to fight corruption, promote transparency, protect and promote oversight of the state. And that means we must focus on those areas which are most vulnerable to corruption, such as conflicts of interest, lobbying, bank and tax secrecy rules, and parliamentary immunity norms, as well as the protection of whistleblowers and ensuring the freedom of the press. So what our index data shows is that corruption, of course, affects people's trust in politics, and therefore it also affects political participation. And what we see is that these two tend to be particularly linked. If you look at it on a regional level, uh, in Latin America and Africa, and also in Europe, um, and in Asia Pacific, uh, you see that there's, in all countries, in regions of the world, there is corruption. And that is also linked then to uh, this ebbing political participation. However, Trust in politician is not only dri driven by perceptions of corruption, but it is a factor. Next slide, please. In terms of uh, the challenge of inequality, we in fact ask the question whether, can democ whether democracy can even counter this challenge. And the reason we say this is because while we have seen that there has been progress in, in combating inequality globally in the world since 1975 in the sense that between countries, poverty levels have improved globally and inequality has declined. Inequality within countries is at a historic high. In 2017, eight people owned as much as the poorest half of the world's population. And in terms of combating this unequal distribution of wealth and power, there are consequences, and these are the risks we analyze to democracy in the publication. The first is that there's a significant detrimental effect on the quality of governance when you have this unequal distribution of power because it, it limits the ability with which governments are able to provide services. It impedes social cohesion, feeds social polarization, and shrinks the vital moderate center of a society. It creates imbalance in voice, representation, opportunity, and access. And it disenfranchises huge segments of the population, undermining also trust in democratic institutions. And it can create social unrest and increase tensions between different groups of society. So if democracy is to prove the resilient and sustainable, it has to address inequality. The problem is there is no automatic relationship we find between democracy and inequality. While in principle democracy is intended to change this distribution of power in society, policy outcomes and inequality also depend on power relations, informal institutions which underpin the political system. And historically one could even argue that some of the most successful attempts to reduce inequality have taken place in non-democratic frameworks. This does not mean, however, that progressive change is not possible under democratic systems. We see countries across many uh, regions which have been able to foster more inclusion and shared prosperity. For example, Botswana, Brazil, Costa Rica, Ecuador, Ghana, India, and Mauritius have adopted policies. They have tackled inequality by getting what we call policies right from a technical perspective, but also um, having, um, finding solutions which are political, politically viable. So the state still remains the most important actor when you combat inequality. Policies matter, but so do the underlying politics uh, in order to combat this phenomenon. On migration, what we have analyzed on migration is, uh, in terms of tackling it, uh, is, is uh, the manner in which um, countries politically integrate legal migrants, including refugees and asylum seekers, has an impact on the quality of their democracy. What I mean by this is that migration poses very difficult dilemmas for policymakers in destination countries. 
because of the way it influences uh, nationhood debates, citizenship, and uh, electoral campaigns. But factors such as citizenship and voting rights and civil society initiatives um, are the ones that uh, create resilience in the system in terms of tackling um, better integration uh, of migrants in the system. So what we find is that when countries are open and inclusive in terms of migration, they also have a higher quality of democracy. This is what our index shows. And lastly, on um, the uh, peace building uh, chapter, countries which are coming out of democratic transition, um, we find that inclusiveness is also the key factor on whether or not countries coming out of conflict are able to do so on the road to democracy and peace, peace, and that is if they design resilience into their constitution building systems, if they integrate former militants into political parties, and if they also choose an electoral system such as proportional representation, which is more inclusive um, for um, their populations, which will uh, in the end determine whether they are better able to um, uh, become a stable democratic country. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you to Natalie Ebert for this very comprehensive presentation. I remind you that you will find the report in its synthesis um, uh, in our library. It's available to all of you in our reading rooms. And it's a report that invites, of course, reflections. And we have invited here today uh, Mr. Kofi Annan, former Secretary General of the United Nations and Chair of the Kofi Annan Foundation, to give his reflections uh, to the audience. Mr. Kofi Annan, we're very honored of your presence today. The floor is yours. Secretary General, Directors General, and now Special Envoy for Syria, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to join you today to launch the first IDEA Global Report on State of Democracy. And I'm gratified to serve as an advocate of his messages. Dear friends, let me first commend the Secretary General of IDEA, Yves Le Thème, and the team responsible for the report, which is a thorough perspective study of where democracy stands today. Its global scope and thematic analysis are truly impressive. I am confident that the report will, will quickly become a definitive reference work on democracy for policymakers, activists, and scholars alike. And it is timely as well as it is ambitious. As this report notes, democracy and institutions of democratic governance are under immense pressures. Rising levels of economic inequality combined with opaque forms of political finance are undermining any notion of political equality. Strident nationalists and populist movements seek to reap the benefits of democracy while denying the exclusivity, that the inclusivity that is at the heart of democratic practice. The age-old efforts to fight corruption and strengthen the rule of law are being compounded by emerging challenges posed by new electoral technologies and social media. Conflicting national and international priorities create the impression that governments are unable to respond to the concerns of the electorate. Levels of trust between elected officials and citizens are at a low. Indeed, the report 
flags 24 cases of democratic backsliding since 2005, thereby reminding us that the transition to democracy is neither linear nor inevitable. One of the great merits of Ideas publication, however, is that it puts today's troubles into context and highlights the spectacular progress accomplished since 1975. At that time, only about a third of the countries in the world could be called democracies. The figure today is about two thirds, although it has to be said that the quality of democratic practice is uneven. Most importantly, IDEA refused the widely held view that democracy has been in decline over the last decade. In fact, most of the countries that have transitioned to democracy have not gone backwards, and standing democracy has experienced a reversal. Democracy is, in fact, incredibly resilient. Indeed, going further back, it is worth bearing in mind that democracy stood up and overcame fascism, fascism which mocked its weakness and its ineffectiveness. Arguably, therefore, democracy is the most successful governing ideology the world has ever seen. My own continent was largely taken over by autocrats and kleptocrats of one stripe or another in the years following the wave of independence. <coughs> Since then, we have seen the advance of democratic practice in many African countries. Just in the last few years, we have witnessed some remarkable transitions in Burkina Faso, Gambia, and now I greatly hope in Zimbabwe, even though the outcome is still uncertain. As the report notes, Latin America, a continent renowned for its cordios, has achieved the most progress with tragic exceptions. And in Asia, where strong men once claimed that superior Asian values were incompatible with, democracy, with democratic norms, most democracies have today emerged in countries like South Korea, Singapore, and Indonesia uh, to prove them wrong. And of course, we don't forget India, the largest democracy yet. These successes highlight democracy's <laughs> enduring appeal and the universal understanding of its transformative potential. There is a global appreciation that Unique amongst political systems, democracy holds a promise of political equality, the empowerment of the disenfranchised, and the peaceful management of social conflict. It affords societies and citizens the rights to have a voice in how they are governed and by whom. Instead of living in fear of their government, citizens want to sanction and replace leaders who fail them and to engage and interact with elected leaders so that authorities can take informed decisions. One of the most striking demonstrations of democracy's enduring appeal is that even openly authoritarian regimes increasingly go to the trouble of organizing periodic elections. Of course, such elections do little to deliver on democracy's unique strengths. Instead, they are artificial exercises which, with predictable outcomes, providing a fig leaf of legitimacy to an otherwise oppressive regime. I believe this is what the greatest threats to democracy today, and it is why my foundation 
has been working these past four years in partnership with, <clears throat> with International IDEA to strengthen the integrity of electoral processes. When elections are conducted with integrity, their outcome is not just legally beyond reproach, but also be perceived by the electorates as legitimate. Elections with integrity empower winners to govern with credibility and authority, and they should protect those who lose from arbitrary reprisals and exclusion. When elections lack integrity, they can prove deeply destabilizing, sometimes triggering, triggering conflict and violence. Dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, the global state of democracy is not only an analytical tour de force, but also a call to action and a reminder that democracy has to be defended. And this is why I was particularly reassured by the finding of this report that democratic backsliding does not weaken people's ideals of democracy. Rather, democracy and the determination to defend it is strengthened in the face of the threats that we are discussing here today. The ability of individual citizens, civil society organizations, political parties, and electoral management bodies, and others to defend democratic ideals depends on a thorough understanding of the state of democracy. The findings and messages of this report are therefore not simply useful academic reference points. They are a fundamental contribution to the empowerment of citizens on which the survival of democracy depends. The global report charts encouraging democratic progress. Nevertheless, we should constantly remind ourselves that democracy is always a work in progress. We must never take democracy for granted. By reminding us of that imperative, the Global Report and IDEA have rendered an invaluable service to the cause of democracy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Anan, and thank you to the Foundation. We have now uh, a few minutes left for question and answers to the authors of, of, uh, of this report. I would like to start this uh, with a short video. Before we broadcast that, I think it's just one minute. I would like to introduce um, the director of the Albert Hichman Center on Democracy of the Gratit Institute, so Rendaria, who is with us. She joins us also. To, uh, to, to give some views, but also to moderate this debate. So if, we, if the video is ready, I will start with that. It's just one minute. And then I would like to hand over to Professor Andaria to uh, moderate the debate.
Thank you very much. Uh, let me immediately turn to you uh, for questions. Um, we have very little time. I think uh, if you are short with your questions, I can accommodate more. Please do us a favor and just introduce yourself and then pose a question to both Mr. Latherm and to Natalie Avad. Please. Yes. I'm with the Global Social Observatory here in Geneva. But also, as an American, very interested in the challenges of social media in the political arena, particularly in terms of how it is contributing to extremes and is being manipulated by large sums of money outside of the political arena. One of the solutions that's being proposed is a digital Geneva Convention. Now, it would be interesting to hear your responses, your thoughts about the kinds of solutions that can be used to work within the framework of existing social media issues to make it more effective and ensure that it, it, it contributes to democratic resilience. Thank you. May I take a few questions together? Yes, please. Working. Hello? Yes, perfect. Um, I mean, my name is Amanda Skor and I work, I'm from the International Chamber of Commerce. And uh, I was wondering, uh, because you mentioned several referendums in between 2015 and 2017 happening more frequently, including obviously in the Netherlands, but also in Venezuela. Uh, and I was curious as to whether you were measuring the, the kind of legitimacy or the, the, the inclusion uh, in each of those referendums. And uh, if so, uh, if the increasing number of referendums rep represent uh, an improvement in democracy. Uh, and also I was wondering what the role of business was in terms of improving democracy and especially in terms of improving and empowering the rights of uh, migrants and women. Um, so I'd be very interested to hear from that. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. I am the Belgian ambassador and uh, very happy to see my former boss, Yves Leterne, here. Now, I welcome this report uh, very much and I think it is very timely because in my job uh, and people I'm talking to here in Geneva, uh, rather more regularly than not regularly, I'm being confronted with statements saying that democracy has had its best time has become much too complex, complicated, too slow, etc., to tackle the challenges of development, of technical, technological development, etc. Um, now, um, these remarks, they come from two types of countries, from hugely successful countries, socio-economically speaking, and from hugely unsuccessful countries, socio-economically speaking. And you have showed in your report that what the dangers are from socio-economic uh, non-development, let's say, or developments on, on, on democracy. But I would like to ask the question the other way around. Is there any correlation, a positive correlation, of uh, democracy on socio-economic success? And how does it play out? Are only democracies socio-economically successful or, or not, and, and so I would like to hear you a bit about that. Should I stop at those three? And then I'll, I'll give you the word and then take the next three, please. Well, first of all, thank you very much for the uh, um, nice comments and uh, observations. Uh, I will elaborate on some of the um, um, ideas put forward and then give the floor to the, uh, to the author, the real author of the, of the report, Nathalie Ebeat. Concerning social media, um, I think this is uh, your point at one of the um, most difficult to tackle uh, challenges, where we kind of feel and have facts and figures to illustrate that, that the societal and uh, political response to this massive breakthrough of the use of social media is a bit lagging behind. We are lagging behind and there should be a kind of catching up effort. Social media are very attractive, and uh, they are very attractive because and to the extent to which they 
kind of bring solutions to, I would not say the weaknesses of representative democracy, but it's to a certain extent what is felt as being the, let's say, uh, challenging negative, some challenging negative uh, or more, more demanding aspects of representative democracy. To be more concrete, when you compare representative democracy and debate, so-called debate, um, influencing through social media, you see that representative democracy is very vertical, is very indirect, is not easy to access for ordinary citizens, is very time-consuming, uh, is very formal. And opposite to that, you see that the typical characteristics of social media or that it uh, enables a very horizontal access without hierarchy. Um, the access is very informal, it's very direct, it's very speedy. You can very fast enter into debate and you can also put forward very simple messages and go through to decision makers with very simple messages. So this is the attractiveness of social media compared to, um, let's say, the, the representative democracy. So what is at stake is how to adapt 19th century formal institutions like parliaments and, let's say, the, the breakthrough of representative democracy in the 19th century, then the political parties as, as facilitating interfaces between citizens and public authorities how to um, change, to adapt these 19th and 20th century tools to 21st century problems and solutions to be brought. And I think that the solutions that, um, let's say, um, ways to address the negative impact of social media, like the lack of nuance, like the, the lack of, of real debate and transparency and uh, the one-man uh, principle that is uh, challenged through the influencing work of social media, this deserves, of course, a very complex answer. But to give you a couple of, um, a couple of uh, directions of where we think that uh, the quality of democratic debate uh, could be enhanced, and by the way, the breakthrough of social media also has the positive uh, effect that more people have easier access to the public debate. But we think that um, working as public authorities uh, to, and also media, of course, to strengthen the issue of facts, figures, and truths, that there is something as reality that um, we have to counteract uh, fake news, that we have to counteract rumors, that we have to counteract the use of social media to be used as a vehicle to bring wrong statements, uh, to influence people with uh, lies and, uh, let's say, lacking uh, underpinning arguments. This is where we should counteract, and it's a shared responsibility. I would add that there is a task for public authorities, just like when there was a breakthrough of the more, um, let's say, traditional mass media as television, radio, and so on, uh, Public broadcasting uh, played a very important role at the beginning and then was translated in more regulations and authorities uh, supervising what was happening in, in radio, TV and, and mass media. We think that we have come at a stage where public authorities should also take a responsibility and should be uh, mediating. Uh, we now see uh, certainly mediating in, in the field where public interest is, is concerned and that public authorities there have a role to play. Um, in organizing uh, themselves, taking the initiative to uh, partly organizing uh, to a certain extent social media, but also in regulating it. We have, it would lead us too far, we have issued some policy papers on this, some, uh, some documents we can share it with uh, people that would be interested in. I will give the floor to, in the interest of time, to Natalie to uh, answer to other aspects of the points that were raised, including the point that was raised by the uh, Belgian ambassador uh, I'm not here as your boss here, I'm here uh, representing Ali, but thank you very much for the appreciation. Um, on the question of referendums, uh, what our index measures is the availability and the use of referendum. So what we see in the world is, and those countries I've mentioned, is that more referendums are taking place over time. Um, 
or are available at least in, in legislation for people to use, but that they also pose very difficult dilemmas in terms of their outcomes sometimes, in terms of the ability of governments then to deliver on what the referendum outcome uh, actually uh, asks it to do. In terms of whether referendums are in fact inclusive, if you pair that with our analysis in the, for example, for marginalized groups such as migrate, migrants, the fact is that only when many migrants become citizens are they also able to take part in referendums. So we do see an underrepresentation of migrants um, in many countries in the world, particularly if they have a very large um, proportion of migrants compared to the uh, native population uh, and, and their inability to take part in, in uh, such key um, uh, democratic mechanisms because they don't have citizenship. So one of our recommendations in, in the uh, publication is in fact that if countries want to become more inclusive, they must consider voting rights for migrants at least on local level. Uh, and sometimes countries um, also already, many countries already do on national level and they must facilitate the, um, the citizenship um, of migrants. Um, on the question of, you know, are democracies or let's say authoritarian systems more able to deliver on social economic equality. Um, that is actually what our report, um, we didn't venture so much because it was a complete comparison between, let's say, non-democratic and democratic regimes to come to a, to a full conclusion. But the fact is that in terms of, uh, that there have been um, reform, land reforms, for example, in non-democratic states that, that perhaps one could argue uh, distributed uh, the wealth better than a democratic system may have done if it had been put to a vote. Um, however, the question with that discussion is always at what cost uh, to other freedoms inside the democratic system um, do these redistributions um, occur um, when, when a country decides to just uh, um, take a unilateral approach to redistribution and not a democratic one. I think I'll leave it there because I think we have a few more questions. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm the Charge and two quick questions. Uh, that one is a follow-up to my Belgian friend's question. Uh, Farid Zakaria mentions uh, a span of GDP per capita, where democracy starts to thrive and it does not. And it's somewhere between $2,500 uh, dollars per capita, uh, two to 5,000 where it's very little possible, between 5,000 5, and 7,500 7, where it starts to be possible to set root. So is there any correlation that you've seen in your studies and would you support any such claims? And the second is something that Isaac Asimov has said some years ago about democracy. He uses this uh, freedom of the bathroom uh, analogy where he says if two people live in a, an apartment and there's two bathrooms, it's very easy for, it to, for them to use it. But if there's 20 people living in an apartment with two bathrooms, then it's very hard to organize uh, when uses, uh, each uses the bathroom. So the point is that democracy starts less and less possible as population grows. And uh, have you seen any correlations in your studies on that? There, but two of you, yes. Then I'll stop there. Could you use the mic? We can't hear you. Hello. Yeah, my name is Sarai Sam. I'm a pro-democracy leader, exile in exile in Denmark. Work for better human rights democracy in Cambodia. Uh, I would like. May I? May I? Uh, my concern re related to the human rights and democracy in Cambodia because recently the democracy in Cambodia has been attacked and also human rights yeah, violation in Cambodia. So Cambodian peoples yeah, inside the country, they need the support from all over the world who support democracy so that they are motivated to do for the work for democracy in Cambodia. So. Recently, many opposition uh, groups. Could you just formulate a question, please? The lady next to you is waiting. Uh, okay, okay, thank you. Uh, uh, yeah, my question is that is, is there 
any action from the international community or United Nations to have those who need support for democracy in Cambodia because right now the democracy who the Cambodian people who support democracy in all we attacked since 1975 until now. Thank you very much. That's the last question I can take. Yes. The trouble with this report is that we all want it sometimes to be more than we would, we, or we discovered that there are many more phenomena that we should be uh, delving into much more research on. So the short answer to the question with the examples you gave um, in terms of the economic um, gaps, we didn't go to that extent into measuring. So we don't, I cannot uh, give you the answer that we see a full correlation in terms of uh, what, what you were asking. What we measure inside the index when we look at social rights and equality um, are things like life expectancy, uh, so basic, basic social welfare, education, literacy, health, and how well countries um, are providing this in terms of service delivery. Um, this is what our index measures. So to go to that correlation that you're looking for would require a whole other subset of analysis, which I believe we can do as a which this, this publication doesn't do. Um, but it's definitely something that um, I think we should do more research on. Um, I, I guess that is also the answer to the question, does our report show whether there's now um, room or demand for more direct mechanisms? I think that's a bit linked to the technology question, and I think that could perhaps be the second edition. Because the fact is we don't actually know how technology will impact on democracy very well. And because we don't know that, our democratic institutions are not very um, prepared or adapt, to, uh, adapt yet to ensure and to respond to the manner in which technology is having this effect. You see it in electoral integrity, and you see it in the way political parties um, are no longer able to um, counter in, interact as, as they did before with their constituents, but you also see it in the way that governments, when they have direct democracy mechanisms, more protests on the streets, must try to respond to those and don't, cannot easily do so. So I think that, uh, that yes, the answer in our publication is that because we see more of this, we must respond to it. Um, but uh, whether we have the tools at our disposal in the classical sense, uh, does does warrant a lot more uh, innovative research and and mechanisms. Here we go. Yeah. Yeah, just a just a couple of words to to add. Um, it it is at the moment not yet very clear what decisive impact the massive use of new technologies and social media to to debate and to interact really has. We should not forget that. Even before the breakthrough of social media, we had some phenomenon that, uh, phenomena that directly impact the uh, extent to which political parties, uh, um, politicians were still able to present a very profiled offer. I give you one example, the convergence of socioeconomic views, the kind of consensus that grew after the implosion of the Soviet system about the socially corrected and, and sustainable market economy, that there has been a growing consensus about this, which made it more difficult for political parties to make a difference. And we see that increasingly political forces have started to profile themselves based on other dividing lines. So this is another source of what we see as a kind of increased volatility in the uh, electoral behavior of citizens, in the political debate. So we should not um, point at the massive breakthrough of ICT as the only source of, uh, let's say, challenges to the traditional, very stable, 
um, only uh, marginally uh, changing uh, nature of representative democracy. But, but I think this, it's worth, um, um, it's worth research, and, uh, but, but the volatility of the democratic and political landscape is certainly caused by, also by other sources of causes. Uh, second element of, of reaction to your statement, madam, and your question, based also on other activities, we see that perhaps, maybe, uh, we think uh, almost sure, the way to improve the quality, to strengthen democratic practice, will be based on a mix, a mix of the already existing, and with whom we have a, with uh, whom we have a lot of experience, existing tools of democratic organizing, legitimacy, and a democratic governance, with elections uh, at all levels, with parliaments, with uh, mandates given to executive uh, on the one hand, but completing that, uh, let's say, that range of tools we already have, and that have troubles in terms of um, still having the confidence of citizens, completing them with more innovative uh, and more direct ways of, uh, uh, let's say, offers of interaction. To so a mix of traditional representative democracy with new tools like uh, massive use of uh, more, more important use of referendum, like uh, kind of liquid feedback organized based on between uh, citizens and public authorities based on the use of, of ICTs, so innovative decision-making in metropolitan areas with decentralized decision-making, counterbalancing the, the uh, more wide scale of, of decision-making. So we think that it's more in a mix of um, existing tools and new tools that solutions can be found to strengthen the legitimacy of uh, decision-making. But it's worth uh, thinking about this when we select a new uh, items to be researched in uh, the next edition. Thank you very much. Uh, let me just conclude uh, with uh, three uh, remarks. Um, congratulations once again uh, for an exemplary report which reflects so much of the progress over the last 40 years, but doesn't shy away from pointing to the risks and the challenges which remain. Uh, just three remarks which underscore and I think ask for an extension of some of your findings. The one is a very personal remark as a migrant. I think I'd really like to underscore the whole emphasis that you place on migration and the fact that there is, it's impossible to have political integration without voting rights. I am somebody who lives in Europe since 37 years. I pay taxes in Austria, Germany, and in Switzerland, and I have voting rights in no country at all. Uh, and I'm a, a, a really good example of the problem of the non-integration of migrants politically, although they're well integrated socially and economically. The qu question I would have had to you is that I think migration is not only a question for the problem for a host but also for the societies from which there is a huge amount of out-migration. So at the moment in Central and Eastern Europe, for example, in the smaller societies, what one sees is the out-migration of young, skilled people leads to a democratic deficit because a lot of your voters have moved out. And I think this is a very serious demographic issue which needs to be addressed if we want to think about voting rights for those at home who have left to live abroad. So there are voting rights on both sides which needs to be considered, I think, and this is an important question which you flag. The second thing you have pointed out to, I think, very a very important point, and that is what you call the modern backsliding in uh, democratic uh, achievements. And this is a, it's a paradox in a sense. It's a systematic dismantling of democracy, especially of liberal democratic institutions, using the law. So it is, if you like, by law to undermine the rule of law. And this makes the kind of response that one can have to it very, very difficult politically, because these are, if you like, formal democracies, and yet what you get is a hollowing out of substantive democracies, especially of democratic institutions. The technological question is, yes, you can tweet a protest, you can tweet a demonstration, but you can't tweet institutions. And that is where the challenge comes in, how to rebuild and how to build resilient institutions. The last point I want to make is, and that is as a social anthropologist myself, and 
I think it's the quality and the variety of democratic experiences which matter a lot. It's difficult to capture it by quantitative indices, uh, but I think qualitative research could show us the different meanings that people attach to democracy in a variety of societal and institutional settings. And that may help us understand some of the paradoxes which are uh, really present if one looks at the kinds of quantitative data which you have. So you have disenchantment with democracy on the one hand and a faith and a defense in the democracy on the other hand. And I think these kinds of paradoxes may be explained if we really are able to study more carefully the nature, what, what are the meanings which people attach to democracy and to democratic values and in institutions. So thank you very, very much and thank you very much for being with us tonight, today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Andaria, and thank you again to, to, to International IDEA. And by the way, International IDEA is also offering a reception for those of you who had to forego, to forego lunch to be here today. Thank you also to my wonderful team to, for putting this together in this big, unusual room for us. Enjoy the reception, and thank you for being with us.